Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. And we're going to start there this morning as we talk about the foundational doctrines. We've been talking about our, our identification with Christ. And our identification with Christ is our salvation. And so now we're going to talk about the things, now that we've talked about the moment you trust the gospel, you're in Christ, and in Christ, what God has made us. So I should write up here on the board, what God has made us in Christ. So we're going to start in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, with uh, the passage that um, sets up, we're going to talk about the doctrine of redemption this morning, and in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the verse reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of sin, sin has wages. And uh, we sung the hymns this morning about being redeemed. And, and uh, Roger, when, when he prayed for us after uh, we, uh, before we received our offering, uh, he mentioned that, the, that we're ransomed, that those of us that the Lord has ransomed. And the ransom or the wages of sin is death. And the death here, the wages of sin that the verse is talking about are the wages that condemn us to eternal judgment in the lake of fire. Uh, we're talking about being saved from hell, and hell is a consequence of dying in our sins without receiving the gift of God's eternal life. So the, the verse says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're talking about the things that God has made us in Christ, and that God's grace and God's love give us the gift of eternal life, but there was a price that was, had to be paid to be able to give us that gift of eternal life, and that's our redemption. Everything, all of our salvation blessings that we have in Christ are hinge on the doctrine of our redemption. Uh, and, and so we're going to talk about that this morning. What is, uh, uh, what is our... Uh, redemption. What does the doctrine of redemption mean? What does that word or that term redemption mean? And it means, a short definition is freedom by the payment of a price. It's an easy way to remember the doctrine of redemption, what it means. Freedom by the payment of a price. Now we all associate the word re uh, uh, redemption, we, we understand it. Those of us who've grown up in areas where there, uh, there's a uh, refund if you take uh, old soda bottles or uh, cans sometimes have a refund I understand in the state of Mi Michigan uh, just it's a good idea it keeps people picking up and not throwing litter down right so redemption is money you get back when you return something that has a redemptive value on it uh, and we're going to talk about Bible redemption this morning uh, and um, but why is it important to understand what the term redemption means? And go with me to Romans chapter 1. Turn back a couple pages there to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to start reading in verse 5. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, the, the chapter opens up, the book of Romans opens with the first verse, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Drop down to verse 5. Uh, he, he talks about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess we need to start in verse 3. Concerning uh, his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. For his name. See that term there? The, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. That obedience to the faith is talking about a body of truth and doctrine that was given to the Apostle Paul for us, the church, the body of Christ. 
that body of truth committed to Paul is, is something that was part of the revelation and the mystery that God has revealed through Paul. And it's important for us to know that truth and be established in it for obedience to the faith, obedience to the message God has given us to walk in. Notice that it says the obedience to the faith among all nations. That, that's a reference to Gentiles, the term nations. In previous to Paul's epistles, the Bible was primarily written to the nation of Israel. And so now with the Apostle Paul, there's, Paul is the first apostle that was sent to the Gentiles. An apostle raised up to take the gospel, the grace of God, to Gentiles. And so drop down now. Uh, we're going to read uh, down through a few verses here. Read with me um, in verses five, uh, verse 6. Among whom ye also are the called of Jesus Christ. Uh, so he's writing to believers, called by the gospel. Verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 9. For God is my witness, he writes, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. What is Paul praying for, for the Romans? Making a request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. He hoped to go to Rome to establish the churches in Rome, uh, that had already heard the gospel. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, had been there, uh, among many others that had traveled there to share the gospel with the, with the, um, with the Romans in, in, the, in the country of Rome. Verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Now, this is the point here. Paul longed to see the Romans so that he could impart to them a spiritual gift. What spiritual gift did he want them to have to the end ye may be established. So the first thing that Paul prayed for, for new believers, and the, and the first thing that Paul wanted to see happen in their lives is that they might be established in the faith uh, so that they might be obedient to the faith. They may have that doctrine that would establish them and ground them firmly as believers. So there's some understanding that's written in the book of Romans that Paul... Uh, felt was vital to any believers that were newly saved so that they could function as a believer, so that they could become spiritually matured, so that they might be established or firmly grounded in truths and, and in the book of Romans above any other book or any other doctrine is laid down the doctrines of justification by faith alone. And so the doctrines of salvation are given here in chapters 3, 4, and 5 primarily, the doctrines of salvation and the terms like the term redemption is one of the terms that you need on board in your life as a believer to be established. So that's why it's important to go through these things is this is how God gives you the spiritual gift of establishing you as a believer. Uh, Paul goes on to say, verse 12, that is that I'm talking about being established. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. There's a faith, a mutual faith, and that's the obedience, uh, obedience to the faith. So there's this faith. We have uh, by, uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. By, we, we study the word of God. That spiritual, it's a spiritual book. God, the Holy Spirit, leads us as we study the Word of God. He helps us to understand uh, by comparing Scripture with Scripture what we're learning. And this is how God gives us stability in our life as a Christian. How He comforts, strengthens us, gives us peace, is through understanding that the Holy Spirit will use in our minds to, to empower us to walk as believers. Uh, so he talks about the mutual faith. That, in other words, that what he understood was given by the Lord, that body of truth would be, would be something that they would also mutually understand and have that same stability and strength that he knew that comes from understanding the doctrines of salvation. Uh, verse 13, he said, Now I would not have you ignorant brethren, uh, that we, we jokingly say the largest denomination of Christians in the world is a group called the Ignorant Brethren. That's because most people don't understand the doctrines of, of salvation as revealed through, uh, the God revealed through the Apostle Paul for us in the book of Romans. 
Uh, this doctrinal foundational book is something that's above the heads of most believers. They have no clue what these terms mean and how God would use them in their lives to bring stability and strength and comfort to them and help them understand what God's doing today. He says, verse 13, Now I would not have you, ignorant brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Uh, for I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so that in me is I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Notice the preaching of the gospel. That gospel there uh, isn't just so that they would get saved because he already called them saints. He already called them, uh, he said their faith was uh, known around the world. So these are believers uh, that he's talking to, but he wants to preach the gospel to them. Well, the God, word term gospel means good news. There's good news for a believer who's trusted that Christ died for their sins to find out that that salvation that they've received the moment they trusted the gospel is something that is eternal, something that is powerful to work in the good news of what God has made us in Christ. So learning these terms, have, uh, God uses to release his power, the power of his grace to work in us uh, when we believe these things. He says, I'm ready to preach the gospel uh, to you that are in Rome also. Verse 16, notice, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness that God has that we need is revealed through the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because he knew that it worked. That if somebody heard it, trusted in it, God would transform them from a sinner that's, that's uh, condemned to hell to being a, uh, an adopted child of God, seated at God the Father's right hand in the heavenly places in Christ, sealed in Christ unto the day of redemption. That's a far cry from being condemned to go to hell for eternity and pay for their sins, their own sins. If they trust that Christ died to pay for their sins and rest in that, then God will give them the riches of his grace. And now, um, what is the gospel message that saves us? The gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we, we read this in Sunday school this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Paul, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So not only is the gospel message that we believe to be saved, but it's also a message that we stand in. That gospel message is powerful. If you hold on to the truth of the gospel and the, and the, and the salvation doctrines, they'll help you to stand solid as a believer, firmly grounded and established. Okay? And he says, you know, some of you were saved by the gospel, but you've forgotten the, the power of the gospel that saved you and the, and the significance of your salvation. You've believed in vain. It has, no, uh, it has no value and effect in your life anymore because you've departed from that message, verse 2, by which you're also saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. Now notice he gives the gospel message in verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. If we trust the part of the gospel, you know, every, a lot of people, a lot of Christians know that Christ died on the cross. They know that he di went to the cross to pay for the sins of the world. And they know that he was uh, buried and raised the third day. But they're not trusting that when Christ died on the cross, he paid for their sins. They're not trusting in his cross work as the only payment for their sins. They might be trusting that he died for the sins of the world, but they don't make it personal and trusting that when he died, they're not trusting in his death as a payment for their own sins. Okay? So that's salvation. And so when he says, um, 
Christ died for our sins, he makes that something that a Gentile anywhere in the world could trust that Christ died for their sins. And that's unique to Paul. Because prior to that, Israel was only told that Christ in Isaiah 53 would die for the sins of many and for the nation of Israel. But it wasn't rolled out to the whole world until God rolled it out through Paul, that it's an everyman gospel, that anybody from any nation, from any culture, from any creed, uh, from any bloodline can trust that Christ died for their sins and receive salvation that moment. So that is the gospel message. And in Ephesians 1.13, the verse says, In whom, Christ, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the moment you trust it, what does God do? Seals you into Christ by God the Holy Spirit. He is our seal, the third person of the Godhead. And in, in 1 Corinthians 12.13, the verse says, um, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So God the Holy Spirit, according to the operation of God, according to uh, Colossians chapter 2, God the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ, and he is the operator. He's, it's not a person uh, that, uh, or a preacher that a month after you get saved takes all the believers down to the, to the creek or, or to the baptismal pool and, and puts you in Christ. God puts you in Christ. Salvation is the work of God. What God has made us in Christ happens the moment we trust the gospel. Go to Romans chapter 3 now. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and look at verse uh, 21. Romans chapter 3 verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, notice, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So who is made righteous when they trust the gospel? Well, that verse says, all and upon all them that believe. When you trust the gospel, you're made righteous that moment, instantly. How? Because God the Holy Spirit puts you in Christ. And in Christ, you're made righteous. Now, this passage, starting in verse 21, down through the end of the chapter and on through chap chapter 5, tells us about all the things that God does the moment we trust the gospel. So notice, if you've trusted that Christ died for your sins, you have the righteousness of God applied to your account. Now, notice um, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being, verse 24 is our verse, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, redemption, again, freedom by the payment of a price that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25 says, by whom God has set forth to be a propitiation right here on the cross. God set the Lord Jesus Christ forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. What, is, what does he mean by propitiation? An all-satisfying sacrifice is what that term means. It's talking about when you see the word propitiation, think of bloody sacrifice, animal sacrifice. But Christ was made that bloody sacrifice on the altar of Calvary, on the altar of the cross. When God saw his shed blood poured out, it covered uh, it, it was the, the blood that was shed to pay for our sins. It was the redemptive work of Christ on the cross to shed his blood as the payment that God would accept. It says in Isaiah 53, we read this morning, it pleased the Lord to bruise him on the cross. God Almighty was pleased. Why? It, it satisfied his justice. His justice was satisfied. He, when he poured out his soul, God was satisfied. Now, what's talking about is justice. God wasn't angry. God the Father wasn't angry with the Lord Jesus Christ. For he hath made him, God the Father made him, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So the cross was the way that our sins have been paid for. Now, the wages of sin is death. There's a ransom that had to be paid to purchase us from our sins. And that ransom was paid with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the verse uh, in chapter 3, uh, back up again to verse 24, 
being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Now, many people understand the love of God. And the verse says, being justified freely by his grace, God's grace. God's, that's the gift principle. Freely, grace. The two words together there, you can't mistake. Salvation is something that Christ purchased on the cross to give us as a free gift. Now, the grace principle, the gift principle, is how we receive it, but that gift had to be paid for. Notice, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. It was the blood of Christ that purchased us from our sin debt, from the wages of our sin. Go with me to chapter 5 now. Redemption again means freedom by the payment of a price. And Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now there's the love of God, that God commendeth his love toward us to go to the cross to die for us. So we understand the love of God, but realize when Christ went to the cross, it wasn't the terrible crime that men committed against him that's the issue. The issue is he went willingly. You remember in Gethsemane, he prayed, he looked into the cup of the wrath of God, and he said, if it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. It was the will of the Godhead that Christ go to the cross. It was his love. God commended his, his love toward us. And there, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more being then now, uh, much more than being now, notice, justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We're justified by the blood of Christ. Now, the word justified means to be declared righteous. It's a, it's a courtroom term, a terminology for justice. And we're declared righteous by his blood. So for God to give us Christ's righteousness required Christ to die in our place and as our substitute. He was sacrificed for us. He, he was made our sins on the cross, and then he died and shed his precious blood to atone us from our sins, to pay for all of our sins. Go with me now to chapter 4. Turn back to chapter 4 and look at verse 7. Uh, chapter 4, 7, uh, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are, what? Covered. The covering is talking about the blood, the sacrifice uh, that was made. Uh, once a year, the high priest took the blood into the Holy of Holies and, and put it on the mercy seat, covered the lid of the ark. Inside the, the Ark of the Covenant was the Old Testament, contained the law that God gave to Moses. So when God saw the law, his justice was uh, needed to be avenged. When he saw the blood, the innocent blood, over the law, he was satisfied for another year with Israel. It was a type of the cross. Our sins are covered. What does it mean to have your sins covered? Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Notice their iniquities are forgiven. What it means to be made righteous, to have redemption, to have our sins covered with the blood of Christ, means we have the forgiveness of sins. So there's all kinds of doctrine that are tied to our salvation, but the key point here is the blood of Christ purchased our redemption. Go with me now to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. First chapter of Revelation in verse 5, I want you to see a, a phrase used here about the blood of Christ concerning our redemption. And in verse 5, uh, down toward the end of verse, it says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What does it mean to have your sins forgiven? It means they were washed away by the blood of Christ. The, you know, water baptism was a type of a ceremonial cleansing, but it was the blood of Christ that washed away our sins. So we have to understand how important the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Christ washed us from our sins with his own blood. 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, uh, talking to the Corinthians, Paul gives a whole list of, of uh, sins in, chapter, uh, in this chapter in verses 9 and 10. But he says, and such were, verse 11, some of you, but ye are, notice, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So notice, they are these things. You know, we're studying, we're, we're, uh, we're looking at um, first, or Romans chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. Being, this is something we are in Christ. So what Paul's teaching us is when we trusted the gospel and God the Holy Spirit put us in Christ, these are things God has already made us in Christ. And he has, we are uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We have been redeemed. Uh, we are washed by the blood of Christ, sanctified. We are justified. You are, notice he says, but you are washed but you are justified. You are declared righteous. You have the righteousness of God applied to your account. Drop down to verse 19. Paul immediately make, makes an application. If you are justified, if you are righteous, if you're declared righteous in Christ, if you are uh, redeemed, you're washed in the blood of Christ, he says in verse 19, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, notice verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body and your spirit belong to God. He bought you, he paid the price. What was the price? The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that paid the ransom of your sins, that purchased you from a condemnation, from going to pay for your own sins in hell forever. He, he freed you from the bondage, from the penalty of your sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You are bought with a price. That price that God purchased, he redeemed you. Redemption has to do with freedom by the payment of a price. You're bought with a price. This is something you are in Christ. What God has made you in Christ, you're bought. You're his temple. His spirit lives, you notice how how amazing that is that God indwells you. You are his temple. You are indwelled by God the Holy Spirit. God, not only are you in Christ, but he is in you because he purchased you with his own blood. Um, even though eternal life is freely given to us, the wages of our sin had to be paid for. God's grace and love wanted to give eternal life to us, but his justice required sin to be paid for. They couldn't, our sins just couldn't be swept under a rug. When the Bible talks about the doctrine of redemption, uh, it's a redemption to be purchased out of a, a slave market. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ paid the price to redeem us from the slave market of sin. In the Bible, redemption could be described with three different words, Greek words. What they are, it's not important this morning. What I want to just explain is the, the word used in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, in whom we have redemption through his blood, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word is a word that means to be purchased as a slave from the slave market and set free by paying of a price. It means the price of a slave's freedom uh, is called the ransom price. According to the type of per purchase here that we're talking about, the ransom price of the slave is paid, allowing the slave to be set free, liberated, delivered from bondage. You could go and redeem a slave out of the slave market for them to be your slave, your possession. But this is talking about a buying out of the slave market to be set free and liberated forever. So that's the, the redemption we have in Christ. God didn't, you know, we're bought with a price, right? Christ, God paid the price to set you free from the slave market of sin. But God doesn't buy that, use that to put us in bondage to him. Instead, he says, you're free as an adult child of God to serve me out of love and gratitude.